Uh, what a genuine joy it is to be here and to be a part of what has already been a most moving and meaningful series of lectures. For the opportunity to be here and for that kind introduction and for your uh, potential indulgence, I am truly thankful this afternoon. Words more majestic, more sublime, more regal could scarcely be imagined. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God separated the light from the darkness, and the light he called day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Several verses later, and some five days hence, we continue the story of creation. And God said, let us create man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all the earth and over the cattle and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. This grand creation story is recapped in one verse in chapter 2 and verse 7 with reference to man. When Moses writes, God formed man to the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Some centuries later, the psalmist would write in Psalm 90 beginning at verse 1, O Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. For ever the mountains were brought forth, or Thou hast formed the earth and the worlds. Even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. In contrast, in that same chapter, the psalmist goes on to say, The days of our years are threescore and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it shall soon be cut away and we shall fly away. So teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. Again, the psalmist writes in Psalm 39, beginning at verse 4, O Lord, help me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is, that I might know how frail I am. My days are as in hand breadth before thee. The Bible tells us that just as in keeping with those good and godly men and their lessons earlier today, we are here because God placed us here. The earth is here not by chance or happenstance, but because God spoke it into existence. And just so man, and that is you and me, we are here because God has chosen to grace this planet with life, and not just life, but human life. And herein lies our challenge. For the brief time of flesh, we are here commingled with this world and living with and as flesh. And our challenge is to live in this world without the world living in us. To live as strangers and pilgrims here. Realizing that yes, we live in a wonderfully blessed and graced world. And yet we are destined by God's eternal purpose for better things. For a higher plane, for something beyond the pale flesh. We're more than blood and bones and body. We are spirits housed for a time within the tabernacle of flesh. 
When God said, let us create man in our image after our likeness, he had in mind more than just a physical being. But he had in mind man created in his image, possessing a God-given, God-like spirit. A spirit that will transcend life and days and months. A spirit that transcends this flesh and this sphere and this world. A spirit meant and made to live with God in heaven for all eternity. It behooves us while here to look up and not down. To look to heaven, not to earth. But to consider things which are above. Some years ago, the statesman Benjamin Franklin, in commenting on an acquaintance of his, said he could name a horse in nine languages he was so learned, and yet he was so ignorant he bought a cow to ride on. And I have often thought that that brief remark so well reflects upon our current climb. We live amongst a culture that is so learned it can name a horse in nine languages and yet has no earthly or spiritual idea of what really matters. We live amongst a people which are intellectually and mentally giants. And yet we live amongst a people that spiritually and morally are midgets. And many of us are paying more attention to the world than to God. The Bible tells us time and time again to spend our time not obsessing upon this life, not spending time, or rather wasting time in looking down to this life, but rather to look up. Didn't Jesus say much of these same types of things throughout his ministry? Didn't he say in Matthew chapter 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt, where thieves neither break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If thine eye be single or focused, then shall the whole body be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, unfocused, or blurred, then shall the whole body be full of darkness. And if that light which is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Jesus, coming from heaven to earth to live for a short time among those of us in flesh, who himself bore the tabernacle of flesh upon himself for a time, realized firsthand the danger of becoming obsessed with the planet, the world, the sphere, the flesh in which he lived. And this temptation did not overcome him. But he realized this temptation would overcome so many of us. He lived his life with a single eye. An eye which was not distracted by the mundane matters of this world. An eye which is not distracted by the things of flesh. An eye which was focused upon doing God's will and going back to live with Him in heaven, preparing the way for all of us to follow after Him. And He taught us likewise to have an eye single or focused upon things that really really matter. In the latter part of that same sixth chapter of Matthew, he continues this same thought reminding his hearers not to be sidetracked by the worries and cares, anxieties of life, but rather, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things, these matters of flesh, these necessities of life, all these things shall be added unto you. On one occasion when Christ was interrupted during an important lesson on a vital subject by a triviality of flesh, 
When someone interrupted by saying, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me, Jesus responded in part by saying, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of those things which he possesses. Well, just so as Christ emphasized the placing of spiritual verities ahead of physical matters, as he encouraged all of his hearers and likewise through them those of us as well to look above and not spend our time looking beneath, just so those inspired penmen which followed his flesh emphasized the same concerns. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For this light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For those things which are seen are temporal. Those things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And in this we do earnestly groan, desiring to be clothed upon with that building which is from above. He goes on to say we walk by faith and not by sight. Likewise, Paul will write in Colossians chapter 3, if Ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth upon the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear also with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And Paul will write the Roman brethren in chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. And likewise, James says much the same thing in his fourth chapter, verse 4, when he says, Ye adulterers, ye adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whosoever shall be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. And Peter writes in his first epistle, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And John. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15, writes, Simply, succinctly, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, are not of the Father, but are of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. Yes, if we're not careful, we'll learn much about little. We'll come to emphasize matters that don't matter. We'll look down and not up. And we'll miss the plan of heaven for us. For just a few moments, I'd like to discuss... The two aspects that John brings up there in 1 John 2 concerning our need not to love the world, nor the things in the world. I wonder sometimes if we don't find ourselves guilty of taking the very teeth out of the New Testament. 
We live here in a fairly comfortable and luxurious 20th century, almost 21st now. And I wonder if we realize the way many of these texts were first understood by those who first read them. For example, when Jesus teaches His disciples in Matthew chapter 16, If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. When we say, well, our cross is that sacrifice we make for Christ, those burdens we bear in following Him, which many of our members decipher to mean getting up on Sunday morning when we don't feel like it. Not sleeping in late when otherwise we could and our neighbors do. And ambling toward the church building in some half stupor type of state uh, to set through sleepily and dozily another sermon. And then perhaps with a slight chance of perhaps come back that night if the cowboys aren't playing late and nothing else comes up. My brethren, if that is our view of the cross we are to bear, I know we've missed the point. And those first readers of the book of Matthew, many of whom no doubt heard the words themselves or heard the words from those who first heard them, and realized that this one who said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, realizing that he took up his cross. And it wasn't some kind of mystical, symbolic ambiguous, nebulous cross, it was a wooden cross upon which his body was staked and upon which he gave his life in death. Those who first read the words realized this religion may well cost us our lives. Not just our luxuries, our lives. Not just our conveniences, our very life's blood. That's what it cost Jesus Christ. And yet centuries have come and gone and much time has passed under the bridge of history and perhaps we've lost the teeth that Christ meant for Matthew 16 and verse 24 to have. Likewise, when John encourages us, love not the world, Don't you believe those who first read the words understood that to mean don't become in love with life itself? Now I realize at this point there may be some disagreement as to interpretation. I suppose the most common interpretation I've read of 1 John 2 and 15 concerns the fact that we're not to love those seedier or more unseemly aspects of the world. And that has a great deal of credence and it discourages me to, uh, to take an opposing view. But I can't help but wonder how those who first read it understood it. This same John will write in Revelation 2 and verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee a crown of life. And the uh, book of Revelation is fraught and full of principles and precepts, examples and messages concerning the giving of one's life by way of service and by way of death if needs be. Love not the world. I can see an old aged Apostle Paul in some damp, dank prison in Rome writing one last letter to his young son in the faith, Timothy bringing to Timothy's mind the service of years seeing the life of his friend Paul. When he says, I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day and not to me only 
but to all them also which love his appearing. I need not tell you of the tribulations and travails of the Apostle Paul, the perils and persecutions that so plagued his ministry, you know as well as I, his problems. I wrote to the uh, Corinthian brethren in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of the various problems he faced, how he was beaten of rods and how he was stoned and how he spent a night and a day in the deep. And so here at the end of his life, he writes to young Timothy, my time is almost up. I'm about to be offered as a drink offering, as it were. In that same context, though, reading just a few verses down in 2 Timothy 4, we read of someone else, not nearly so deserving of our accolades this afternoon, a man named Demas. Paul speaks of his appearance before Nero. He says, No man stood with me. All men forsook me. Yet the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. In that context of thought, he says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, I know we shouldn't love the world in the sense of becoming obsessed with the luxuries and the blessings of this life around us. I know we shouldn't love the world in the sense of spending all of our time in front of the television and not coming to church services. I know that. But those first Christians who first read the words, love not the world, who themselves were being persecuted and perhaps had lost family members already in death because of their faith, when they read the words, love not the world, would they not understand those words to mean, don't become so obsessed with life that you lose your soul to save your life? Love not the world. The Bible tells us of the first Christian martyr. His name was Stephen. The book is Acts, the chapter 7. John Fox in his book of martyrs tells us that perhaps seven years took place between the death of Stephen and the death of James in Acts 12. And that during those years as many as 2,000 Christians were martyred for the cause of Christ. It was Tertullian who later said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Of the twelve apostles, Matthias now taking the place of Judas. Of those twelve apostles, a mixture of Bible and history and a smattering of tradition tells us that eleven of them died as martyrs for the cause of Christ. We live in such a safe and luxurious time and place that we may take for granted that very safety and fail to realize the stern warnings of Scripture against falling in love with this world at first surely meant life itself at the expense of one's soul salvation and soul's convictions. And I grant you, we have difficulty getting this message across to ourselves, much less to our memberships. We talked to a Sunday morning assembly about being willing to live and to die if needs be a painful and torturous death for Christ, realizing that many of them won't even come back that evening. And knowing that, we step back and we water down the message of Scripture as if to give across the message, well, as long as you do the best you can where you are and, and do a little bit, you'll be all right. But then further, John doesn't just stop with saying, love not the world. He says, nor the things that are in the world. And this may be more problematic to us than the first. As in the first century, the first part was more problematic than the second. Because we don't face the prospect of losing life because of our convictions, uh, we're more inclined to stumble on this second aspect. 
the things of the world. It's always been a problem. When Christ chided that querist in Luke 12, Beware of covetousness, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things he possesses. He brought to light the fact that people have always been, as people always have been and always will be, in love with the things of this world. And yet, as a people, as a culture, we do have more and spend more and waste more and throw away more than any culture past or present. Love not the things of the world. Oh my, you look around and you realize how different we have it than those in the first century. When Jesus spoke in Matthew 6 about His disciples being drawn away by their anxieties, their cares, their worries, He chided them because they were worrying about things we would consider necessities. Take no thought what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink or wherewithal ye shall be clothed. Now wouldn't you consider those fairly matters of necessity? We're not talking about a new car or a second car or a boathouse, or a boat to put in it, or season tickets. We're talking about food and drink and clothing. And yet Jesus condemns those who are so distracted by such matters, they lose their faith in Almighty God. O ye of little faith. And then I consider us. Here we are midway through the afternoon and I uh, think I'm safe in saying that every one of us either had breakfast this morning or we chose not to have it. We ate lunch or we chose not to eat it. And we'll have dinner this evening or we'll choose not to have it. We really don't have a real problem with our next meal. We worry about whether or not we'll have enough retirement 20 years from now or what the bond market is doing to our retirement plan. We are more concerned about whether or not we can afford the new car to replace the one that's just three years old now. We're concerned about matters of luxury and worrying about the lack of those in contrast to those of past ages who worried about necessities and we would think had something to worry about. Those who lived during Jesus' day, many of the common uh, people, did not know where their next meal would come from, what they would have to drink, or what they could wear if the clothes they were wearing then wore out. And yet from their position of lack and poverty, Christ condemned them for worrying, saying, O ye of little faith. And yet we, with so much more, may worry more from our abundance than they worried from their lack and poverty. And what would Jesus say to those of us today? O ye of little faith, with how many exclamation marks after it, nor the things that are in the world. We sing songs suggesting our gaze toward heaven This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. And yet for all of our singing about heaven, our desire to leave this life and spend a blissful eternity in heaven with the Lord, uh, don't we, many of us, most of us from time to time, find ourselves caught in the quagmire of life and living in bills and problems and worries and and the things of this world. I've often wondered about the song we sing. I, I sing it as well, but every time I sing it, a, a question 
races through my mind. It's the song that begins with the words, I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days. And what I wonder about is, could Paul have sung that song? Paul, who wrote the words, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I am in a strait betwixt two, having desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I'd like to stay here longer than man's a lot of days. The fact is, that fairly well suggests the way we think. We talk about heaven, we sing about heaven, we rejoice in thoughts of heaven, and yet we'd just as soon stay here as long as we can. Because, face it, many of us are in love with this world and the things of the world. We have been engulfed by the darkness of what might best be termed this worldism. To see the stars of heaven shine, to see the Lamb of God as mine, to feel the warmth of love divine is but to look above. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the heaven and earth fell away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by those things written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it, and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven. And a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem. Coming down from God out of heaven. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from heaven saying. Behold the tabernacle of God is with men. And he shall dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And he himself shall be their God. And shall be with them. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. This being the case. Why not look up? Thank you.